will give you an idea of how long it's been around, when that original rock, when that original rock was formed. Now the real benefit here is that this is a process that occurs within the nucleus of the atom. Because it occurs within the nucleus of the atom, it is not affected by the environment. So it doesn't matter if it was hot, if it was cold, if this stuff got eaten, got decomposed, whatever. It's not influenced by the surrounding environment. Okay? So it's like, it's like really, we're really, really certain about this process. Of course, there's a lot of variability in when we make our estimates of the age because, you know, there's just a lot of variability. Uh, but we don't have to worry about contamination occurring, which is really nice. So, for example, you have some organism that is taking in these isotopes, carbon 14, for example, which is the case of carbon 12. It dies. When it dies, it's no longer taking in carbon 14, right? It stopped. That process has finished. So, whatever carbon 14 it has when it dies, over time it decays. And then you can look at the ratio of carbon 12 to 14 to know when it died. Okay. That gives you an how long it how long ago it lived. Cool. Questions on that? No? All right, cool. All right. So Moving on. One of the challenges of the fossil record is because it's so incomplete, we have a hard time determining what the true evolutionary steps were. This was, we're leading into uh, cladistics, which we you know, did in lab, and we'll get to your diagrams later. But I want to talk a little more about this idea of convergent evolution. Convergent evolution occurs because all organisms are trying to, well, they're trying to. Natural selection is selecting for certain traits given certain environments, right? And different species will experience those same environments even though they have a different evolutionary history. So, for example, there's similar selective pressures in the desert, right? It's very dry, it's very hot. <coughs> Certain adaptations work well with desert. It doesn't matter what your evolutionary history is, you're going to be selected in that direction. So we see that with cactuses and these things called spurge. This is not a cactus, it's actually a separate type of plant. Why they look so similar? Well, having that, that fleshy uh, stalk helps them to hold water. Having leaves that are spiny like that helps them, one, to avoid predation, because in the desert, everything wants to eat them. Okay? And then two, it reduces evaporation. All right, so dealing with those same pressures has led to the same adaptations. Another great example of this, the, what we call the fusiform body shape. It's this kind of hydrofoil body shape that we see in fishes, we see in marine birds, and we see in marine mammals as well, okay? Why do they all have that same basic shape? Come to find out, laws of physics say that is actually the most efficient way to move through the water. That's why we see it in um, submarines, that's why we see it. Actually, airplane wings work the same way, they all have that same basic fusiform shape. Because when you're moving through a fluid, Having sort of the bulge in the front and then a tail that goes out like that works really well for push, pushing through fluids. Okay. Doesn't matter what your evolutionary history is, natural selection is going to force you in that direction. Questions on that? No? Now, what we talked about in lab this week, you would not use the fusiform body shape as a synapomorphy, as a shared derived trait, because it evolved separately in each one of these lineages. It is not shared by the common ancestor of all of these organisms. Now, somebody asked, don't they have a common ancestor? They absolutely do. It was a fish, okay? Um, but along the way, that fish, which actually was fusiform, changed 
evolved, some evolved to reptiles, which became birds, and some of those reptiles became mammals, which then became porpoises. So that's kind of an interesting example there. So the fusiform body shape actually was lost in the evolution of, from fish to reptiles, and then reptiles to mammals, and then mammals to, 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 to cetaceans, it was re, um, it re-evolved, it showed back up again. So they lost it, and then they got it back again. That's kind of cool. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to skip horses. Because, well, let's go back to horses real quick. We can look at certain traits, um, and it tells us a lot about the lifestyle of an organism. So, even though the fossil record is really incomplete, we can um, deduce many things about the organism just from a little bit of data. Horses. So when horses first evolved, they were much smaller than they are now. Um, and they had funny feet. So remember the ancestral form of all vertebrates is to have five digits like, like we have. They have these four digits. And what happened over time is the uh, distal digits got smaller and smaller and smaller until finally they were walking around basically on their middle finger. And the middle finger had a huge, still does, has a huge nail. What do you call the nail that horses walk on? That's the hoof. Basically it's the same thing as our nail. As they've grown, as that's grown, the horse itself has gotten bigger. What's the advantage to getting bigger? Well, if they're bigger, they can travel farther. They have to eat more. Um, there's an interesting uh, ecological corollary to this, which is as the um, uh, ice age progressed, uh, things dried out and there were more grasslands. And so as these grasslands, particularly in Asia, grew and grew and grew, the horses adapted to that, covering long distances. In response to all that extra grass, notice what happened to the teeth of the horses. Their molars got bigger and bigger and bigger, better for chewing that grass, crushing that grass. Interestingly enough, there's also a cool correlation between horses on land and diatoms in the ocean. So the more grass that the horses were eating, the more poop that they were pooping, that's what happens, and grasses have a lot of silica in them. All that poop from, all the silica in the poop made its way into the ocean, and what we find corresponding with the evolution of the horses is the evolution of all these new diatom species, because they were putting more and more silica, which is what diatoms use, into the oceans, and we have this huge diversity of coastal diatom populations. Yeah? What is this diatom? It's a diatom, sorry. It's diatomaceous earth. These are diatoms. Yeah, they're made out of silica, right? Which is basically glass. And their evolution was fueled by all these horses, and not just horses, but other ungulates, grazing these grasses and pooping out all the silica into the waterways, which made their way into the ocean. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. So these are microscopic phytoplankton that live in the ocean. Kind of neat. Okay. Types of macroevolution. So remember, macroevolution is the evolution of big things or large scale evolution. Speciation is a form of macroevolution, the evolution of new species. It can also include the evolution of new traits. Like the horse's hoof, like the whale's fluke, like the loss of our tails. So when we're looking at the evolutionary tree, um, Change in the evolutionary tree show up in two ways. One we call anagenesis, <clears throat> excuse me, 
and one we call is inside cladogenesis. Anagenesis occurs when there is change in one lineage over time. All right. So here we've got time on the y-axis, on the x-axis we have phenotype morphology. Here there has been no change in this lineage over time in the morphology. It stayed exactly the same. Like the horseshoe crabs, right? They've been the same for millions of years. This is slow change over time, whereas this is rapid change. Now, this is where defining a species becomes challenging. At some point, this species here, if it changes enough, looks different. So different that we say, oh, that's a different species. But the problem with the biological species concept is we can't take an individual here and mate it with an individual back here, right? It doesn't work. They're separated in time. But we know that they fundamentally look different. The crazy thing is they're related to each other, but they've become different species, right? Like if you went back into our own lineage, you'd go back far enough to where you'd get to a point where we look like monkeys. That's our ancestor, but it's a different species. At what point we became a different species? Hard to say. Questions on that? How do you know our ancestor looked like a monkey? Our common ancestor of a monkey? Uh, because if you look at our fossil record, we're, we moved in that direction. But couldn't the monkey have evolved into a totally different, like had kind of evolved almost similar, similarly to us? What's that? Is there evidence of this? Is there evidence? Yeah, there's, there's lots of evidence. The law of parsimony is the simplest explanation, right? Right, there could be some intermediate ancestor where we had five limbs, we had wings, we walked on our hands. Is there any evidence of that? Is there? No. No. This the theory. simplest explanation. We have evidence that humans got larger over time. We know this really well, right? We know that our closest relatives are monkeys. So the simplest explanation is that we share a common ancestor that looks something like a cross between ancestors that we know we have and our most recent relative, right? Like that's the simplest explanation. Is it possible other explanations exist? Yeah. Is it likely? No. Do you have any evidence to support it? No. So fossils is the only evidence that we got that looks or ancestors. What's that? All right. What's the question, Muhammad? So fossils is the only evidence that we got that looks like our ancestors look like our I don't like the word prove. So in science, we don't prove anything. If you've taken cell biology and you've taken chemistry, they like to say proof. And it comes from mathematics where there are proofs. But we don't actually prove anything. What we do is we have evidence to support, but we have evidence to reject. All right? All of the evidence that we have from the fossil record indicates that we evolved in Africa, that we are members of the primates, uh, and our closest relatives are the chimpanzees. Now, what evidence is there in addition to the fossil record? DNA. Our closest DNA relative is the chimpanzee, with which we share 98% of our DNA. Could there be another species out there, maybe in the past, that went extinct, with which we shared 99% of our DNA? Maybe. Almost like, yeah, it's, it's quite possible. What did it probably look like? Something between us and a chimpanzee. 
right? Because all the evidence we have of all of our relatives are things that are somewhere between us and a chimpanzee. How do you know this? How do you know this, Muhammad? What was the lab we did two weeks ago? All those fossilized skulls, right? That have traits somewhere between human skull and that of the apes. Yeah? What is Neanderthal man's name? One of our relatives. And it wasn't just a man, it was a woman too. <laughs> Neanderthals are, one, are, are cousins of us. Yeah? So are they a, a different species? Different species, yeah. To a certain extent, though, we were able to interbreed with Neanderthals. Some of us have Neanderthal DNA. I do have some Neanderthal DNA. <laughs> if you have European ancestry, chances are you have Neanderthal DNA. Mm -hmm. Other questions? What's up? We can't test the DNA of the fossils? Uh, we can't, no. Yeah, that's how we know if we got if we have Neanderthal DNA or not. Yeah, man. Um, so how did those DNA like, saliva chips work in this in the two and then they tell you like like five percent like your like what's your PN or like yep. two percent like Filipino? How does that work? Uh so as humans moved around the planet through natural selection, sexual selection mostly. Uh, we changed and developed different traits and characteristics that have a genetic basis. And we now have markers for those. We know that if you have a certain set of alleles, that your ancestors lived in a certain part of the world. Yeah. It's kind of cool, really. Who's done their, who's done their ancestry? Anybody? My sister did. Do you know that the FBI is now getting a hold of all the DNA? So even if your cousin relative did it, they can link you into if you ever had a crime and they had your DNA, so they can find you now. So, so the take-home like, message from that, Eric, is don't do that. <laughs> My sister already did it, so like I'm done. <laughs> I'm already in the database. They already know who I am. <laughs> was that one of the reasons she chose to do it? She was like, I know my brother. No, she yeah. called me and told me. She was like, Gary, well, you're linked in the DNA now. I mean, <laughs> that ain't scary. Baze, you do it? What, was it interesting? Yeah. I got exactly what my parents always told me. My parents always said, your mom's half Irish and half German, your dad's half Italian, half Lebanese. And I got the results back and was like, yeah. I'm a quarter British Isles, a quarter Northern European, basically German, quarter Italian, a quarter like Lebanese, Syrian, North African. Like, yeah. Yeah. Nothing too crazy. Yeah. What I was really worried about is my wife's family is, is from nearby where my family's from in Italy. And I was worried that we were going to show up on each other's family tree. Like, that was great. That was so All right. We're going to get more into DNA in a little bit here. Um, OK, cladogenesis. Cladogenesis occurs when there is speciation, where there's a branching of the phylogeny. And the branching can occur either gradually Right, as is in this case here, or it can happen rapidly. And it's, we don't really know why. So for some cases, it happens super rapidly, other times, it happens super rapidly. So I remember cladogenesis, clades, cladistics. These are branches. This is a branching of the phylogeny. So there was, it's not as big of a deal anymore. Um, there are these competing hypotheses about the rate of evolution. Some people are what are called gradualists. Um, 
E.O. Wilson is probably the most famous proponent of this notion. E.O. Wilson wrote that chapter, that book, um, Social Conquest of Earth, that you guys read. This is the classic Darwinian view of things, which says small changes over long periods of time have a large impact. And so it says that evolution is driven by these slow, gradual changes. This is one example looking at the number of ribs and trilobites. Um, these, these are trilobites here. They lived a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, basically it's looking at counting the number of ribs. And what you can see here is that the number will kind of shift back and forth, but it's sort of a slow meandering change over time, right? You'll all of a sudden have go from having like, you know, 12 ribs to like 50 ribs or something like that. So just explode. That's, that would be support for the gradualist hypothesis. There is another hypothesis that was championed by a guy named Stephen Jay Gould, who is an amazing writer. I was kind of a shitty scientist, but whatever. Um, and he was a big fan of punctuated equilibrium. Uh, he died about 10 years ago. And um, when he died, people sort of stopped talking about this. I think because the only person talking about it was him. <laughs> I'm sorry. Stephen, I think it's PH again. Stephen J. Um, yeah. And he was a paleontologist. So uh, E.O. Wilson studied ants, um, still does. So he was an ecologist, whereas Gould was a paleontologist. So you can imagine if you're looking at, at paleontology, you're looking at huge you know, tracks of time. And so you tend to see bigger changes, right? So here's Gould. Um, looking at uh, these are these are actually uh, diatoms, um, and looking at these big jumps and morphological difference. The, the issue here, though, this is my problem always with punctuated equilibrium. They tend to look over really long periods of time. So, like a jump, like a, a rapid increase, could actually be a slow, gradual change over the generation time of the organism. But it appears like a big jump when you look at it at a, at a larger scale. So we do know that there can be these, these adaptations, these mutations, which create pretty sudden change in a species, and they do last for whatever reason. The truth is probably somewhere in between. I tend to be more of a gradualist, but from time to time there are new mutations that do show up and like, whoa, look at that. In humans, an interesting one there is like green eye color, um, which appeared uh, in you know, Northern Europeans uh, about 20,000 years ago. And uh, it stuck around, right? So all of a sudden, like, whoa, all of a sudden you got these people with green eyes. Or like red hair, right? There's another one that's like, whoa, like that stuck around for some reason. Those kinds of things usually stick around for, um, not because of natural selection, but because of sexual selection. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> different mechanisms and modes of macroevolution. All right. So, um, when we talk about evolution, we're talking about evolution of the entire organism, right? We oftentimes think of you know, humans, when I, when I mention like a human, you probably think of this, right? But the reality is that humans go through all of these stages, and all of these stages are under pressure from natural selection, okay? All right. Now, this is kind of cool. When humans develop, when they grow, notice that different body parts grow at different rates. When babies are born, they got huge ass heads. <laughs> My friend's son, his head was like in the 99th percentile. When he would show him books, he couldn't show them like this. He, he would look up and fall over because his head was so big. They had to like show him stuff like that. Okay. Um, 
we have big heads when we start out because our brains are super important. And then the rest of our body is basically catching up with our heads, okay? We go through various growth spurts. We grow a lot when we're little, and then from about the age of like six to 12, we don't actually grow that much. And then what happens? Oh God, yes, puberty hits, and everything goes haywire, right? It's like that, but then after puberty, what happens to us? We stop growing, that's it, right? By the way, not all species are like this. You know? um, fish, for example, uh, not all fish, some fish, like halibut, they grow their entire lives. The older they are, the bigger they get. Trees are the same way. The older a tree is, you know, the bigger it gets. Okay. Um, but we have this, you know, this way of growth. I mentioned this when we were looking at uh, the skull lab a couple weeks ago. Allometric growth in humans versus chimpanzees, or humans and apes in general, is fundamentally different. Notice that between an ape chimpanzee and a human chimpanzee infant, the skull is very, very similar. Very, very similar, okay? But what happens over time? As we grow, our brain case you know, grows bigger. Our jaws grow a little bit, but that's basically it. We're sort of like, we're kind of like just bigger babies. However, I mentioned this before, in the case of the apes, the chimpanzee is an example of this, what grows a lot? Yeah, the jaw, that muscle, okay? That really gets much, much bigger, very, very. Okay. So as apes, chimpanzees mature, they have more of this muzzle of piercing, they have canines, right? We went through this in the skull lab. Okay. <laughs> One of the ways in which humans separated themselves from the chimpanzees is a process known as pedomorphism also known as miyami. Miyami is a shorter word. So miyami is a macroevolutionary process that creates new species. It's a simple way to separate species. And it occurs when individuals become sexually active while they're still juveniles. So sexual maturity at juvenile life stage. Okay. Great example of this are oxalotls, which you guys have seen the oxalotls we have here? Okay. So oxalotls are amphibians, right? Amphibians are born in the water, Eggs, eggs are laid in the water, and then they mature, they leave, go on to land for a while, come back and lay their eggs in the water. All right. In part of their development, amphibians will have these external gills that help them to breathe out of the water. What happened with the oxalotls is they began, instead of leaving and going on to land and coming back to reproduce, they just never left the water. So they were able to reproduce without going through that de next developmental stage. They started reproducing basically at a younger developmental stage. Okay. And humans did the same thing. And that was one of the mechanisms that allowed us to separate from the chimpanzees. We, there are two ways you can think about it. You can either think about it as we developed sexual maturity at a, at a earlier developmental stage, or we have a prolonged childhood. That might be a nice way of putting it, right? So we stretch out our developmental childhood longer and longer and longer until we hit sexual maturity, okay? Which is to say, we love youth. Humans, and this is true around all cultures, love youth. 
everybody's always trying to look young. We all want to be young. We're fascinated with babies. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould actually wrote a very interesting uh, story about this in the evolution of Mickey Mouse. Okay, so one of the things that makes a baby a baby, you notice as a baby, are big eyes. Right? If we go back to allometric growth, babies have big heads, they've got big eyes. Okay. If you look at Mickey Mouse over you know, over time, what you see is he started out as a very mischievous, kind of like rascally mouse with small little beady eyes. But look at the size of his eyes over time. They get bigger, they get bigger, they get bigger, they get bigger. And he almost becomes even more youthful, right? As we, you know, get to know him better, we want him to be younger. It's kind of strange. Because humans are attracted to young people. We're attracted to youth. This is why um, cosmetic companies make billions of dollars a year, right? Most of you are still in that beautiful, youthful phase of your lives. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get to that point where you're like, oh, man. And it's not, by the way, it's not just women. Men do this too. It's, it's, you know, I need, to, I need to color my beard. My beard's starting to look right. I gotta color my hair, right? I gotta get rid of these, these wrinkles on my, you know, my eyes. I gotta do all this stuff, right? Because you wanna look young. Because evolutionarily, we have been driven in the direction of being younger and younger and younger. Because we have gained sexual maturity at a relatively young developmental stage. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. You said that it was uh, relatively young compared to, especially if you compare it to like chimpanzees, yeah. is there like at what point, how old are they when they reach that chimpanzee? Younger than us. So they actually, it's not it's not the actual age, it's the developmental state. So the other way of thinking about it is that like, we just mature insanely slow, right? Anybody who's raised children knows this. Like kids take forever to grow up. Like, holy shit, <laughs> right? And they, and we take a so the other way of thinking about this is that we just take a very very long time to mature, right? Our our physical development is very slow. Whereas in the case of the chimpanzees, it happens very rapidly. When we get into ecology, we'll look at um, life histories. You can think about part of the issue is that you only have so many resources. Are you going to put those resources into developing physically, or are you going to develop? <laughs> Uh, socially, and humans have chosen to develop socially. So what's really, really important to us is to create societies and to pass knowledge down from one generation to the next. That's why you guys have to wait until you're 20-something years old to enter the workforce, right? I mean, that's so many years of knowledge acquisition that you have to, you have, to have before you're considered to be mature enough to work as an adult, you know? I mean, if we're solely based upon physicality, uh, you know, we, you could imagine that evolution would push us just to be bigger, faster, stronger at a younger age. And that's how most animals work, right? Because that's what really matters. But humans being really social beings, it's important for us to develop those bonds and to have that knowledge. And the only way we get that is from preceding generations. So we spend a lot of time with our children, making sure that they grow up to be, you know, the way we want them to grow up. But it means they stay children much, much, much longer. Interesting side note to this is menopause. Right? You guys know what menopause is? Now you'd think if the goal of natural selection is fitness to have as many offspring as possible, why is it that human females stop being fertile at a certain age? This doesn't really make any sense. You'd think you'd want to be as fertile as long as possible. Okay? But the reality is that we, as humans, have invested heavily in the education of our offspring. And we invest a lot of resources in individual offspring. So it's a quality versus quantity issue. So women basically you know, stop reproducing in their 40s so that they can spend more time taking care of not just their children, but their grandchildren as well because it's better for us, we do better as a species, if we invest more 
in our kids. Nicole. All right. Let's take a break, and we'll come back. How is this even? <laughs> 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 